All right, we are live on YouTube. Okay. And now it's time for me to talk. Hi, my uh, name is it, it's, no, no. All right, I'm pleased to welcome Stephen Krashen and Nusha Ashtari, who are here to give us two talks, one on Reading. Self-selected reading, the most powerful tool we have in language education, and the other, the path to heritage language development. I'm going to turn it over to Stephen now. Okay, very, very good. Um, and the two talks are very closely related, as you will see. It all comes together. Reading, libraries, that's where it's at, folks. Well, that's really my talk. I could stop here, but I'll give you the details. First of all, let me tell you uh, what my goals are and why it was a good thing that Marky called me Stephen. We've talked about this. I don't like being called Dr. Krashen because that the real Dr. I'm not the real Dr. Krashen. The real Dr. Krashen is my son, who's a math professor. Can you imagine that? Children succeed where their parents fail. I'm going to talk about reading today, but before I do that, let me give you my true goals. I want to save you a lot of work. It's teaching is going to be a lot more easy and a lot more pleasant uh, if we pay attention to the recent work. It's going to be easier for us. It's going to be more effective. And my other goal is to save you money. And here's how I'm going to do this. Um, if you want to do professional reading, which we do want to do when it's interesting stuff, it's nearly impossible because everything is too hard to find and much too expensive. I have canceled nearly all my subscriptions to professional journals because I can't afford them. I have not bought a single book in uh, language education in three years. And I've stopped writing books because nobody can afford them. I'll tell you how it all started. It's been burning inside me since over oh, about 10 years when I was invited to contribute a chapter to a book called Input Matters, clever title. And I was invited because I was known for you know, getting people excited about input. I wrote the book, a chapter of the book and I had such a good time writing it. It was very long. I don't write long things anymore and I'll tell you why. And I included everything I ever wanted to include. Uh, I talked about uh, comprehensible input and reading and how it applied to reading, how it applied to first language, how it applied to second language, child second language, adult second language. I had a long section on animal language. Does the idea of input apply to animal language? And my conclusion was, yeah, sort of, nearly, it comes very close. And just self-indulgence, I also had a long footnote on what will happen when the aliens finally land. The flying saucers from Alpha Centauri and Zeta Reticula. Will we be able to talk to the people from other planets? Well, it turns out uh, there's some evidence that they're already here, as you've probably read, uh, and they've come in the form of mushrooms. Isn't that interesting? And if you wanna communicate with one, you eat one and they'll talk to you, but that's another topic. And I put all that in the book. The book came out the other chapters were quite interesting by colleagues doing other work in uh, input. It sold for $160 hard copy. Now I can get copies at a discount because I'm like an author. Even at discount, I couldn't aff afford to buy copies for my cousins, which I usually do. And I found out that the publisher was charging huge amounts of money for all their books. A book called Poverty and Education sold for $160 hardcover. The irony was lost on the publishers. Even softcover was too much, 65, 70, $80. And I decided then, this is it. Uh, I will not mention the name of the publisher, Multilingual Matters. Anyway, uh, and other publishers were doing that too. The price was getting jacked up all the time, all the time, which means that if you're a scholar and you put an article in one of those books, it's dead. No one's going to read it. It is doomed to oblivion. And I found out how the publishers make money. University libraries are obliged to buy copies. 
So there they go, they sell enough this way. So I changed my ways and here's the new, the new deal. I now write only short articles, not long ones. Try to keep them clear, easily to, easy to understand. And I publish them in what are called open access journals, free to the writer, free to the reader. Not only do I publish in these journals, but I put them all on my website, sdcrashen.com. Uh, operators are standing by. Now just go there and you can download. Don't ask me permission. You can download as many as you want. If you're teaching a class in language, uh, language acquisition, you can get them for your students, et cetera. They can download them. And there's an organization called ResearchGate, which I really like. And I put my articles there too. And they take these expensive articles and simply make them available to anyone who wants, who wants them. So you'll find the articles are short. You'll find, I hope that they're easy to read. This is the new deal. Otherwise the profession is going to die. No one can read what's happening. Okay. Uh, I'm going to begin, I'm not going to go through the background on comprehensible input and the natural order and all that stuff. I'm, I'm going to assume you, you might know about that since so many of you are about involved in English language teaching, et cetera. I'm going to talk about one part of it. And this is what I've sometimes called the reading hypothesis, which is an offshoot of the idea of comprehensible input, which I still think is absolutely correct. And I'm going to say that reading especially a certain kind of reading is the source of our literacy development and a lot more. Self-selected is the key. Our work on comprehensible input says that the best kind of input is not just comprehensible, it's also compelling, which means it's extremely interesting. So interesting you forget that you're reading in another language. Self-selection is the way. We love books that we select ourselves. We're not so interested in assigned reading. There's a wonderful quote by Garrison Keillor. Remember him? He was on the radio all the time. And he says, since I was a former English major in school, my friends all think I would like to have classics as gifts. So I have all these books and they're all there on a shelf that are all great with a capital G. And I walk by the shelf and they're staring down at me, making me feel guilty because I haven't read any of them. Books as gifts are assigned reading. And that's, and I've been cleaning out my shelves as everyone my age is doing, trying to downscale a little bit. And there are all these books that are gifts and I don't know what to do. I feel guilty getting rid of them. I'll tell you, if you go to the uh, Santa Monica library, you'll find some of them because I blot out the part that says to Steve, my buddy, enjoy. And I give them away to the libraries and, or give them to their little book sale parts. We don't like assigned reading. We like self-selected reading. It is this people, self-selected reading, research of the last 20 years. This is the source of our language. It's the source of our grammar, our writing style, our reading ability, our vocabulary, and I'm talking to you, Donald Trump, the source of our spelling ability. I actually got a letter to the editor published in the Washington Post about Donald Trump and his spelling. I'm a great admirer of Theodore Roosevelt, who said that it is our patriotic duty to criticize the president. We are not there simply to be a cheering section. It is our obligation, and I've done quite a bit of that. I've been very busy doing that in recent years. And the Post had a series of papers, a series of articles on Trump's spelling in which they defended him. They defended him uh, and said, well, all this stuff about people being angry at his spelling, um, it's, this is only details. All he needs is an editor to go over that and to, to use spell check more, what's the big deal? And my letter said, that uh, I take this very seriously because spelling is the sign of a deeper pathology. Uh, spelling comes from reading and we know that Mr. Trump is not a reader. He has said so basically. And we know it's not just spelling. Reading gives us grammar, writing style, as I've said. And reading gives us other things. Reading gives us a huge amount of knowledge. Much of our knowledge comes from reading, reading fiction. 
The studies show, and you'll find all this stuff on my website, including the letter I wrote to the post. The studies show that those who read more know more. They know more about a lot of stuff. They know more about literature. literature. They know more about history, social studies. They know more about science. And they know more about practical matters. And this all comes from reading fiction. I'm engaged in an informal experiment on this right now with my cousin. I'm very close to my cousin, Evelyn, who's been my helper and friend and role model since I was a little kid. She's a little older than I am. In fact, she's 93 now, she just had a birthday. And we've been talking a lot. She always says that she always admired her husband, Marty, who's a really good guy, uh, because he had a law degree and he knew a lot about the law. And she's thinking of taking a course in legal matters. And I said, Evelyn, don't do that, read John Grisham. So she said she'd try it out. She's been reading John Grisham novels. I've been sending her novels. And since I'm talking about it now, I can de deduct the expense from my taxes. You're my witness. She's been reading The Runaway Jury, The Appeal, all these things. She said, I am learning so much about the law. And it's all so effortless because the stories are so interesting. My hypothesis is that a year of John Grisham, 10 John Grisham novels is like a year of law school, pretty much. This comes from reading. Reading also promotes, and I'm not done with Donald Trump yet in case you're listening. Uh, reading also promotes what we call positive habits of mind. People who read more, and it's primarily fiction that does this, have certain attitudes that are very positive. An article appeared in um, The Guardian uh, a couple of years ago, and it was an interview with Barack Obama and they asked him what he read. And it was as if he had just read all this research. He said, I have learned from reading lots of fiction that people are different and yet you can agree with someone and find points of contact and have a sympathy for their points of view. Um, the other problem, the other uh, habits of mind, tolerance of vagueness. You don't look for simple solutions. You realize the world is complicated. The simplest solution is not always the best. Now, I hope you're thinking Donald Trump as I'm going through all of this, not just his spelling problems, but also in his lack of knowledge of certain basic areas and certain basic areas and his willingness to embrace very simple solutions and to not understand people who are a little different from he is. So this is what reading gives you and it's fiction. It is stories that make the world go round. Um, I've given you all the theory I want to give you, and I want to talk, jump into um, application right away because it follows naturally from the research I've told you about. Stories is always the beginning of language development, and it's the beginning of literacy development. First language, kids like to hear stories. Children like to hear stories. They like to hear mommy and daddy tell them stories. They like to hear mommy and daddy read them stories. One of the most important people today is, uh, my opinion, Jim Trelease, the Read Aloud Handbook, because he's been responsible for an interest in read alouds to kids, which has had a very positive thing. Kids like stories. 95% of children, this is the result of research, say they like their parents to read to them and tell them stories. The 5% who don't, their parents don't like to read to them or tell them stories. It has this influence on language, it is enjoyable, and it is a path to reading. It's a conduit to reading. They read things, they hear stories, and they want to read the books. Uh, a paper done by a former student of mine, uh, Danny Alfred, the title of the paper told it all. 15 books were taken home by students, 14 were read by the teacher in class. Well, we have embraced this in second language. We know that <clears throat> stories is a wonderful way to begin second language instruction. Several methods rely on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'll talk about the one that I'm the most interested in called story listening, uh, <clears throat> invented by Benico Mason. What she does is tell stories in her beginning and intermediate language classes. The first and the first level always begins with stories. 
She selects stories that she tells in class that are of universal interest. In her words, stories that have stood the test of time, basically the Grimm's brothers and other fairy tales. She makes them comprehensible. She tells the story, she makes a list of the words and expressions that may not be completely comprehensible and she focuses on them. In advance, she knows how she's gonna make them comprehensible. Her favorite device, draw a picture. Explain the story more, talk to, or explain the new vocabulary more, say what it means, bring in synonyms. It pushes the stories along and it adds more richness to the story telling the, and occasional translations when that's possible. She does not expect the students to learn and master the new vocabulary. Her goal is to make the stories more comprehensible. The irony is that this turns out to be a better way of getting new vocabulary than vocabulary building activities. Classic experiment replicated several times that she's done a number of other people and they're all on the websites. Um, she tells a story, does these activities, these comprehension aiding activities, and then compares it to telling a story and adding vocabulary building activities. Draw a line from the word to the definition, write three sentences. When you do that, kids get more vocabulary if you test them later, but it takes a huge amount of time. It turns out if you look at the number of words acquired per minute, you're much better off with just telling more stories. It's much more efficient in the long run. So this is how it's used in first language, how it's used in second language. Story listening naturally leads to reading, self-selected reading. And our eventual goal for our second language students is that they become independent readers. They find the stories themselves, they select the stories themselves, and they develop a reading habit which guarantees their progress forever. We don't, read, we don't need return business. We want to make our students independent. Well, a good, if you plunge right into, and this is what I've learned from Dr. Mason, if you plunge right in to hard reading, into self-selected reading and great stories, it won't be comprehensible. So she has inserted a stage for beginning readers. After you've heard lots of stories and you're interested in reading, she has a stage that she calls guided self-selected reading, where the teacher helps the student select books and also make sure, helps make sure that they're the right books for those students, that they're gonna be interesting and comprehensible. It's largely based on our old friend, graded readers. In the uh, university where she taught in Japan, she made sure the library was overflowing with graded readers. And I'd like you to be very impressed by this. She put together a library of 5,000 graded readers. All the series, the Newberry series, the Longman series, all of this was there. So students with the help of the teacher could select ones that are interesting starting at the lowest level. Now, what we did in language class when I was in school, in high school, oh gosh, we didn't have graded readers. I took French class. I gotta tell you, I got a passing grade in French after two years under the condition that I never study French again at that school because my teacher wanted to protect his reputation and he also didn't want to ruin my record because I was such a horrible student. Anyway, so I, I really owe him a lot. My French today is actually pretty good. I managed to uh, get over that. She had this huge collection. Students would begin, they would read not just one tiny story. Going back to French, you remember what happened in your language class is one story, one reading selection. It's designed to help you practice the words that are in the story, target words. And then the second lesson, <clears throat> You had another story, which was very difficult because it had all the new vocabulary in it. I made a breakthrough around this time. I, I decided, or a little later, I decided when I was a professor at USC that I would start to acquire Spanish. Good decision, I think. 
And what I did, I took out one of these grammar books and read the first story, great. I went to the second, it was too hard. Third one, impossible, because they had all the new stuff. So I went to the library, took out 10 grammar translation books, read chapter one of all of them. Much easier, not very interesting, but much easier. By the time I got to chapter eight, I could already have an easy conversation, beginning conversation in Spanish. So this is basically what she did. They stay in this uh, period for several years. You read 100, 200, maybe even 300 graded readers, all highly comprehensible, all reasonably interesting, and your teacher helps you select them. When you've done that, you are ready for authentic books, read books written by native speakers, for native speakers. Since I'm undergoing voluntary isolation, as most I think reasonable people are, uh, I've been doing, I've been reading graded readers. I can read complicated Spanish. I, I got through um, Isabel Allende. Oh my, is she good. I read uh, Zorro two summers ago and it was hard, I have to admit it, but I skipped over, uh, et cetera. But it was so interesting, so compelling that I, I pushed on because everything she wrote pushes you on to the, next, uh, to the next paragraph. But I've been doing graded readers here and I'm getting better. I've been reading graded readers every day since I've been in isolation in Spanish. I'm soon gonna run out and my Spanish is getting better. It's the only Spanish that I'm interacting with are these graded readers. Uh, I take a Spanish test every week at Ralph's, drug, at Ralph's uh, supermarket. Uh, one of the uh, checkout guys, uh, I finally got people to speak Spanish with me. Usually they don't want to because they, you know, they think it's, you know, you don't think I speak English, that kind of stuff. But I figured out how to do it. One of the more friendly sales guys who does the checkout, I said, mi meta es hablar español como ustedes. And my goal is to speak Spanish just like you, which is true. And he really warmed up. We speak Spanish all the time. I only go in there once a week when the old people are, are can shop. And I've noticed his Spanish is getting more complicated and faster. He's reacting to me. And this means I've been reading a lot of Spanish. I'm actually getting better, no question. This stuff really works. The final stage is to bring you to the point where you can actually read authentic things. I wanna give you a little bit of the research here and uh, go on from there. Uh, some of the best studies, I'm skipping around in the research. A study I co-authored with uh, Nico Mason. My way of co-authoring is really good. If you're a professor, try this. They do the work, I get the credit. This is what happened with uh, Dr. Mason. She taught at the university in Osaka and she taught, a, uh, among other things, part of her obligation was to give a basic English class to anyone who wanted to show up in the community, which was a lot of fun. She got a lot of variety. The class was basically uh, stories and the homework was reading graded readers. And after the semester was over, uh, students would ask her if she would continue to work with them, basically be their guide in guided self-selected reading. So she got about 10 students and she said, I'll do it for you if you agree to take pre-test and post-test and alternate forms of the TOEIC test. A lot of you know what the TOEIC is. That's the big exam all over Asia. People take it everywhere. TOEIC is known by everybody. There's one guy in Japan who takes the TOEIC every year. This guy has too much time on his hands and he gets 100% every time and gets his name in the paper, okay? But it was a nice collection of people, very different. Uh, and she asked them to keep a record of the books they read. From that record, uh, they read different things, by the way, but there was a heavy, most nearly entirely fiction. They self-selected it and a heavy tendency toward young adult fiction, which as you know, is really excellent. Uh, in addition to graded readers, they read, of course, Harry Potter, which is really first class stuff. Uh, Hunger Games, all these wonderful uh, books written for younger readers. And from the titles, and we estimated how much time they put in, and they did it for some cases a year and a half. We had all these records. 
Here is my conclusion. For every hour you read self-selected reading, you gained about a half a point on the TOEIC, 0. 0.6 tenths of a point. Uh, Abenico has just done more subjects and it looks like it's closer to 0. 0.7. So every hour you go up over a half a point. If you extrapolate that and you say, how much do you get in 100 hours, 200 hours? Let's say you read 300 hours over a year, which isn't that tough. You go from just about around 200, which is the threshold for being able to read independently, up to around 800, 900 on the TOEIC. You go a long way toward acquiring academic language. Not only that, we also found that there was very little individual variation. I wrote a paper on this, which <clears throat> Korea TESOL published for me. It's on the website, you can find it. Uh, sdcrashen.com is where I keep all my stuff. And uh, we found that this helped answer a question. Is there individual variation? Is there a talent for languages? And the fact that everyone did pretty much the same, my conclusion was, if you get interesting, comprehensible, what we call optimal input, and you get a lot of it, individual variation is vastly reduced. Maybe there's no gift for language. Maybe we're all the same if we get the right input. Now, a paper published, a study published on native speakers, I thought was very, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> it was done by a group in the UK who've been doing research on the same subjects for over 40 years. The same researchers have been following them since they were little kids. Same researchers, they must be pretty old by now. Anyway, they're hanging in there. And here's what they, the last time they did it, they studied these same subjects every two, three years and gave them all kinds of tests and interviewed them. These are all native speakers of English. The last time they did that, they gave them a vocabulary test. Here are the predictors of vocabulary knowledge for native speakers of English. Number one, reading obviously was by far the best predictor. Fiction did better than nonfiction. The power of fiction, I'm so impressed with stories and how powerful they are. Now, uh, Jeff McQuillan has found that if you read lots of fiction, you acquire a substantial amount of so-called academic vocabulary. Now, a fiction contains a respectable amount of, of academic vocabulary. One author, which uh, Dr. McQuillan cited, who Dr. McQuillan cited, said if you do a year's reading of science fiction, about a million words, you get a stunning amount of academic vocabulary. So again, fiction is the way to go. Now, I've basically given you my main point here. I want to <clears throat> conclude with a sermon. If this is true, students need access to books. We have paid very little attention to this. They need free and easy action, access to books. I've been very frustrated on this with my effort to build up and promote libraries because for children of poverty, libraries are their only chance. And it's getting worse because of the coronavirus situation. Libraries are the only chance. So we must pay attention to libraries. Here is my argument in brief, and I've included this in a number of uh, letters uh, to the editor, et cetera. What the research shows us is that, uh, in my research here, one of the many studies is based on our analysis of the PEARLS examination, which is a standardized test given to children, 10-year-old children all over the world, many 40 different countries, and the reading comprehension test. The biggest predictor, poverty, no question. Stronger than any other predictor, and this is an old result in literacy studies. Children of poverty all over the world have, a much, have much lower uh, scores than middle-class children. I think, yes, poverty has all kinds of negative things, uh, uh, food uh, problems, problems in getting the right food, uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, proper nutrition, etc. But reading is part of it. 
they have children of poverty have very little access to books. They have very little access to books in the home, very little access to books at school, very little access to pleasure reading books outside of school because, and their only chance is libraries. If you add libraries to the equation, in one study we did, basically it balanced the effect of poverty. Children of poverty who have access to libraries read in our first study, read just as well as middle-class children because they had access to books because of the books in libraries. The second study we did, uh, we found that we got similar results. Uh, libraries didn't quite make up for all of it. It was about 40%, but it certainly reduced the nature of the problem. Uh, these are my, this is my work uh, co-authored with C and Lee, uh, co-authored with Jeff McQuillan, et cetera, uh, Christy Lau. We found it everywhere. The problem here is that I have not been able, and I want you to help me on this, to convince even librarians that this libraries need to be taken care of. We already have brilliant research by Keith Curry Lance that shows that better school libraries mean better reading scores. This is what we need libraries for. It's the book collection that counts and giving kids access to books. Uh, school libraries and public, public libraries especially are starting to bring in curbside service, which I think is a positive step forward. Our goal is to make sure children of poverty have access to books, plenty of them. That's the main function of school libraries today. We must take care of that. Make sure we have librarians who know what children need, children want to understand what a good book is. I'm sympathetic with everything libraries do in general. I like the fact that they supply computers to people who wouldn't have access. Um, they do read alouds, that's wonderful. I've done some of them. Uh, the important thing is make sure there's a good book collection and that kids have access, everyone has access to books for pleasure reading. It is the core of the library. Let me go on to bridge to the next part Let's say we have the books there. How do we get the kids interested? Kids don't want to be with books. Uh, they want to play with their computers and all that. And I don't think that's bad, but there are ways of doing it. How do we make sure uh, reading helps academics? Uh, Donald and Miller, some of you have heard of, is from Fort Worth right down the freeway from you, um, has a book called The Book Whisperer, which I like a lot. And The Book Whisperer really talks about kids self-selecting books. Uh, in one of her observations, she has a brilliant suggestion for marrying self-selection and subject matter. For example, in one class she taught, the district syllabus, district guidelines said, you must cover biography, okay? Another one, you must cover World War II, fine. Yeah. What she did is she said, okay, kids, I want you to each read three books. At least this is for native speakers, but you see the point. Three books about World War II. Three biographies, et cetera. You can have any biography you want. You want Justin Bieber, go ahead. You want Barack Obama, go ahead. The kids all read three books of their selection. They would come to class, say 25 kids in the class, having read 75 biographies. They knew what a biography was. She said the discussions were quite brilliant. This is where we get our subject matter knowledge. You get it from fiction, from free reading, from self-selected reading. Another method I think of bringing these things together was uh, the idea of a woman named Adriance is her last name. She wrote a a feature in one of my favorite journals, the School Library Journal, I can't afford it anymore. It's a good journal, uh, called The Star Method. She published it in comic book form, it's cute. The librarian or the teacher would say to the kids, if you like a book, take out your pencil and put a little star in the book. You can write in library books, then put it back on the shelf. The books that were starred got more circulation. Of course, I tried this out with a school I worked with in, uh, in Asia. 
it did definitely in Korea, definitely works. You put the star in there, kids, they see a book with 25 stars. They know this must be a book, good book. And they themselves have the privilege of putting in the stars, etc. So these are ways of pushing it a little further, but it all begins with access to books. And it all begins with books that have what we call optimal input, that are comprehensible, that are compelling, where there are a lot of them, a lot to read with rich language in it that makes the world more comprehensible, makes the story more comprehensible and gives them a chance to pick up new language. That is my um, presentation today. Let me turn the platform over to my colleague, Mushan Ashtari. Thank you so, so much, Professor Fashion. As always, very insightful and great. <laughs> so thank you so much. So I'm going to um, also talk about optimal input reading and self-selected reading, guided, uh, guided self-selected reading and story listening, but I'm going to focus more on heritage language acquisition in general. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can see my PowerPoints and then I'll walk you through the presentation. So sharing the screen. Oh, it seems that um, the host needs to uh, allow screen sharing. I'm so happy when you have problems. <laughs> I know. There's so much more about this than I do. It makes me feel better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know. You're welcome. It's all for making you feel better. Thank you. <laughs> technical issues at all. No, it happens to all of us every single day. Now I understand. It that. should work now. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So let's start from the beginning. So the path to heritage language development. So I'm going to continue talking about these concepts. But since we were talking about story listening, um, I want to start, I would like to start with a story. I'm not going to go through this story, but I'm going to start with it and we're going to finish with it. So many of you might have read this book, The Missing Piece by Shel Silverstein, um, that is about this circle, semicircle, it's not a complete circle, that is looking for that little missing piece that it has. And it goes to all these different locations trying to find that missing piece. And, um, you know, there, there are ups and downs along the way, but think of that, think of this incomplete circle as our heritage language acquirers who are trying to find that missing piece that connects them to their heritage language and um, their heritage in general, culture and language. So we're going to come back to this missing piece. Have that in your mind. So now let's have a very quick overview of some of the concepts that Professor Krashen so amazingly talked about. So the optimal input by Professor Krashen and Professor Mason had four different criteria. So the input has to be comprehensible, it has to be compelling, very interesting, it has to be rich and abundant. Now let's connect that with heritage language acquisition. First of all, what do heritage languages mean? Especially in the past 50 years, um, the number of immigrants in the world has increased substantially. Um, there are around 300 million, according to United Nations um, current statistics, 300 million immigrants in the world, and the number keeps increasing and increasing every year. So these families and these individuals who uh, go to these other countries, uh, go and live abroad, their children may or may not speak the parents um, language or heritage language, which is, um, and they, they usually go with the, uh, with speaking the dominant language of the country that they're currently in. Now, when it comes to Iranian families and um, Iranian diaspora, there are, the number is increasing every year, um, but th there was a statistics and the statistics are not 100% accurate. So there was one in 2010 that estimated two to three million Iranians living ab abroad. But um, I'm assuming that number is much higher now. Um, and also, Los Angeles was one of the first places that uh, 
Ukrainians moved to or immigrated to. And the number seems to be around 500,000 to 1 million. I'm assuming it's again much higher than that. But let's let's go, let's stick around that um, number. And that is one of the reasons why Los Angeles is called Tehrangelis or Little Persia because of the substantial number of immigrants, Iranian immigrants um, living here at the moment. Now, now that we know that there's a significant population of Iranians living in Los Angeles, we notice that not a lot of children or second or third generations of these families speak Farsi. Um, so we wanted to see what is causing this. Not, not, not that it's, a, it's an issue, but a lot of these families uh, do express concern that the children are not speaking Farsi. And a lot of these kids want to acquire Farsi. So we set up interviews with Farsi language acquirers and we found that most of them do not improve beyond basic level of proficiency. So in terms of saying hi in Farsi, which is salam, how are you, hubi, khubam, they might be able to say all those little very basic level uh, words, but a lot of them don't move beyond that level. And a, a significant percentage go to heritage language classes, especially in LA, in Los Angeles area, there are some heritage language classes that they can go to. Granted, that's not the case all over the world, of course, but these heritage language classes, even in places that they do exist, don't seem to be effective. And the reason for that is they use traditional methods of instruction. So a lot of us might be English, teachers. So we know that we've been using these traditional methods over and over again for years. And they are also used in heritage language classes. And we can see that they're certainly not working. And when it comes to heritage languages, a lot of the times the children and the parents get blamed. Oh, why didn't you teach your children um, the heritage language? Why? And the children also blame the parents. Why didn't you teach me? Why didn't you let me acquire Farsi? So this blame goes over and over and over again, and um, it brings us to study it even more because of the importance of it, especially within these communities. And these, um, the concepts that we're talking about do not only pertain to Farsi. So think of it as heritage languages in general, because I saw in the questions um, that Stacey and Marky kindly uh, shared with us that the, there were some questions about other heritage languages. It's it could, they could all apply to other heritage languages as well. But this is more specific in terms of it's, it's, um, it, it's a unique case in that case that the number is increasing, especially in this area, in Los Angeles area, it's becoming more and more prominent in terms of its significance. So we wanted to see the reading material and resources that are available in Farsi. So we went to Farsi bookstores in Los Angeles because uh, there are so many, so many Iranian owned businesses because of the number of immigrants again. And we interviewed them to see what kind of materials they have for Farsi heritage language acquirers. And the sentence that you see here, um, the new generation does not speak Farsi, does not read Farsi. That was echoed by a lot of other bookstore owners and also people around that are saying that, oh, the new generation they, the, the quote that is usually used is that is not interested in uh, acquiring Farsi, which now we're going to look more closely to see why that is. One of the reasons is lack of accessibility. Um, there are some studies that are taking place currently in other countries as well. This is one of them by ABN Seals in 2019. They studied New Zealand and they also found that one of the main challenges for lack of proficiency in uh, Farsi for heritage language acquirers is not having appropriate teaching materials and books. Um, this was also the case with Farsi in uh, bookstores in this area that because the customer, the number of customers has decreased substantially, the number of the books and the different kinds of books that they have in stock has decreased as well. Also, the, the, even the ones that they do have, even the books and materials that they do have are not comprehensible for heritage language acquirers. When we asked the bookstore owners what the number one seller of Farsi um, 
language books are, they said, first one is the Iran's first grade textbook, which is not the current one, the one that was, that was, that was used 40 years ago before the Iranian revolution. And also another book, which is this one, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's this book that is um, very similar to the first grade book. It's a compilation, compilation of uh, the different sections of the first grade book. So I don't know if you can see it or not, but there are words. But the good thing about this one is that it has the Romanized version of the book, uh, of the words and some of the phonetic symbols and things like that, but it's very much the same. Um, as the first grade Iran's book. Now there are two points when it comes to these two books being the best sellers. So that means that these are the books that are currently used for heritage language. Um, these books are designed for native speakers of Farsi. So imagine you're a first grader, six, seven years old, you already have been exposed to Farsi or the language for all those years. And you can speak it, you can, you have good comprehension, in terms of the language, but if you're a non-native speaker and this is your very first time um, trying to acquire the language, most of it is not going to be comprehensible for you. It, it, it will seem very foreign um, to you. And also many of these heritage language acquirers are not at the age of a first grader. So some of them are in middle school, some of them are in high school, a lot of them are adults that after a while they see, oh, okay, I really want to learn my heritage culture and language. Um, and they start with the first grade book, which is not ideal for anyone. And also uh, another thing was that a lot of these buyers do not come back to get levels two, three, four and beyond. So it, that the bookstore owners were also saying that they were showing me on the shelves. They said, look here, these are the first level Farsi language books. So most of them were gone. And then level two, three and beyond, none, almost none or one or two were, were only bought. So you could see that they're not coming back to continue acquiring the language. And one reason for that is that because these books are not compelling, um, they're not interesting for Parsi heritage language learners and are, they're also not comprehensible. So Mason and Crashen and Mason also emphasize the importance of having an abundant quantity of comprehensible and compelling reading materials so that we make the experience more effective and pleasant for everyone. And this was also another quote that was echoed by others as well, that they don't have any simplified books in Farsi. And that can also be the case for other languages, French and German, or even more Arabic, you know, other heritage languages as well, that this, there are no simplified books that um, children or even adults can learn. Uh, one of them said that we have a few children's books that do, even children don't want to read because they're boring. They're not, they're, the language is difficult, especially Farsi is one of those languages that the written version is very different from the spoken version of the language. The written version is very by the book and it's very um, formal versus the spoken language is more informal. So reading those kinds of books is not going to um, let them have that continued interest in the book in, the, in a way. And also libraries, because there are so many libraries around in this area. Um, we wanted to see what kind of resources they have. So we searched the databases of 72 branches of Los Angeles Public Libraries. And remember, we had around 500,000 to 1 million um, Iranians living around this area. So out of all of those libraries, they only had 300 books in Farsi. Comparing the numbers, that's not, that's not significant at all. And even from those 300 books, only 12 were checked out at the time when we, when we were doing this study, which was winter 2019. So, that kind of tells how compelling or uncompelling um, these options are for Farsi language acquirers. Another study that was very interesting and very crucial in terms of how we can see even, even the books that are checked out. So remember, 12 books were checked out. So we wanted to see how interesting or compelling those books are and how far do readers go along with those books. One of the um, studies that really informed this, um, this research was uh, 
by Professor McQuillan, that was also we talked about, um, Professor Krashen talked about in his talk, that um, he used a method that is called unobstructive measure um, to see whether foreign language textbooks actually get read. So not that they are taken out, but how much of them, how long do readers go uh, within reading the book? So three main criteria. So we wanted to look at the books and see if there's a separation on a page or a binding, fingerprints, smudges, any kind of wrinkled pages. So even if whatever you book you have, you can just take a look and you can kind of tell on which page you stopped reading the book, which I thought it was a genius idea. When Professor Krashen mentioned it, I was like, this is really fun. I mean, we need to do this for Farsi. So the languages that uh, Professor McQuillan um, studied were Spanish, Portuguese, German, Chinese, Italian, and Cantonese. And out of those languages, it turned out that around 16.8% of the books were only read and maximum of 27%. So around 10 to 20% were read only. Now, we wanted to see what's the case for Farsi. So we went to the library, we took out some books for Farsi language acquisition, and we tried to see the pages that were read. And it turned out it's even less. So it's 5% only. So that 5% in a book, it's only a few pages. So that means that it, it, the, the materials are not compelling enough for anyone or even interesting enough for them to go through more than 5% of the books. So apparently, obviously, they're not really um, very helpful in terms of language acquisition. Now, what can we do about this? Remember our the missing piece of story. So we want to really help that incomplete circle um, to find that missing piece. And it was very interesting for me that in all of these bookstores and uh, all these language, Farsi language acquirers and people that we interviewed, a version of this quote that you see here was brought up in one way or another. I'll read this one for you. It says, when they get older is when they usually come in. They go to graduate school at UCLA or another university in their 20s and 30s. They realize that they can't speak their mother tongue. That's when they start coming to get books or take Farsi lessons. They realize that a piece of them is missing. So there is definitely this desire to want to acquire the heritage language, not only Farsi in all these other languages as well. So what can we do about it? How can we make it? How can we help these semicircles, the, these incomplete circles, find that missing piece. As Professor Krashen also talked about, providing optimal input, story listening, and guided self-selected reading. Now, there are some options here and there, but this is for our responsibility, not only for Farsi, not only for English, but also all these other languages to provide resources. And, and it can be the, you know, speaking and reading that are comprehensible, they're rich, they're abundant, and compelling for our language acquirers through story listening, guided self-selected reading. Some, um, some um, materials that we can use, there are websites that you can find some stories. For example, storiesfirst.org is one of these websites that there are stories in different languages and teachers can also contribute to them. They can, they can find stories or they can write stories and they can upload them there and other teachers can use them too or other language acquirers. We have some, I started the Farsi section. So if anyone is interested, they can, they can keep adding to these stories. But there are also so many stories that have stood the test of time that you can use in order to gauge their interest and one of the things that I admire about Professor Krashen and Professor Mason's work is that they say, they always say that the purpose of education at any level is to get the students to a point that they can be autonomous. They can find materials that they find interesting and they can, they can grow from there. So we can provide these stories so that we, we create a foundation for them and then they can find things that are interesting to themselves and they can they can find and grow from there. But helping them find that missing piece is our responsibility by knowing what we can do and how we can help them. So with that, I'm going to go to the references and I'm going to stop sharing the PowerPoints. And if, I think we're gonna go to any to questions, I believe, right?
Um, there have been a few questions in the YouTube feed. Um, the first one, what do you all think of the Accelerated Reader Program? And Dr. Krashen, you still have your uh, speaker muted. Unmute. Okay, you have my voice and you have my ugly face. All right, here it is. Well, you just have my voice. You just have to make do do the video. Okay, Thank accelerated you. reader. Yeah. Definitely accelerated reader. Um, <clears throat> I've written several articles about accelerated reader. They are on my website sdcrashin.com, etc. And <clears throat> I think it's horrible, frankly. Um, the evidence for it does not support its claims, which was the title of one of my papers. There is no evidence that kids who use it uh, will continue to read for pleasure. Uh, in fact, I don't think they've even looked very hard. Uh, it sounds great to a public that's used to being rewarded for things, but it sends the wrong message. And this is a traditional complaint about reward systems, one that Alfie Cohn talks about. And that is when you give someone, when you give someone a reward <clears throat> for doing something that's already pleasant, you're telling them it's not pleasant and that no one would do it without a bribe. That's the problem. That's Alfie Cohn's common sense. It's called turning play into work, basically. Uh, but the research also does not support it. Kids who do these things do not become better readers. They don't learn to love reading, et cetera. Frankly, I think it's a disaster. And I have, in my papers, I have tried to review up until the time I wrote the paper, article after article claiming that it works and showing that it really doesn't. Any other questions, Your Honor? <laughs> yes, um, what are some graded readers that you would recommend? Well, I can't tell you that because it's up, it's self-selected. How do you like that? I have my favorite <laughs> authors, okay? Ariana Rodriguez has written some great ones. Hey, you wanna know someone who writes great stuff? Those of you who know second language acquisition theory, um, Bill Van Patten, you heard of him? He's a theoretical guy and he gives talks on theory. He's pretty much on the ball with that, but he writes fiction. I've been accused of writing fiction, but I don't. And his, <laughs> stuff, his stuff is so good. What these people uh, have been doing is making graded readers into real literature. Rihanna Rodriguez, well, I'm, I'm about to write her and I'm gonna say that your story of a cyclist is like the book of Job in graded reader form. Uh, so we're seeing a, a increase in quality of, of graded readers. Find them yourself, try the STAR method, let your students um, recommend them to each other and you'll, you'll know which ones are good. And what I think is good may not be what other people think is good. I like Bill's stuff, it's deeply personal, brother, sister relationships, things like that. It may not be your, your cup of tea. So there are good ones out there that I've liked. That's really all I can say. The new and I think the star method is very good in terms of the location because sometimes in one geographical area, there are interests there, there are groups of specialist students that are interested in similar things. And then after a while, you will have a list of things that the, the books and graded readers that they can yeah. go and find. And create it, that's good. Exactly, it will be over time, but it's gonna be helpful. Um, one, of our um, attendees wrote, he was wondering why fiction stories give impact, give more impact to readers than nonfiction ones for helping them to develop reading comprehension. Oh, fiction, wonderful. We, stories are everything. This is the conclusion I'm gradually coming to. <clears throat> I have underrated the importance of stories. Now I fully, I got into it living in California where my drive from home to home from where I was in the city was on Pacific Coast Highway, which is like 40 minutes of total boredom. So the way around it, taking advantage of the library is to get uh, books on, you know, book stories on disc and whatever I could. 
And I started looking at stuff I normally wouldn't do just to be happy in the car. I got into John Grisham. That was the point. I got into uh, detective stories, things I never would read. They're good. They're really good. All these things were beneath my dignity. You know, after all, I'm this big shot professor and scholar. The stories are wonderful. And the breakthrough was Harry Potter, of course. When I started, I read, I did Harry Potter on disc because it was an obligation, because I'm a professional. And you reach the point, I'm telling you what you already know, you're driving and you have to stop somewhere on the way home to get something. And you don't want to get out of the car when you're in the parking lot. You want to hear the end of that chapter. And you realize the author has really gotten to you. And you see examples of it in your daily life. It is how we live. Uh, when I first, I finally got around to reading, I did it on disc, Murder on the Orient Express. Crazy. Wow. In fiction, you are the character. You are there. You are facing the decisions that they go through. And you learn by their decisions. My breakthrough actually, again, I can only tell you about myself and I hope it relates to you too. John R. Tunis, T-U-N-I-S. I read my first John R. Tunis book when I was in elementary school. It was called The Kid from Tompkinsville, Baseball Stories. I have reread that book four times since then. Once when I was at my cousin's house in Chicago and I stayed in her son's room and I saw it on the shelf and I reread it. Another time when I was in Ethiopia working in the Peace Corps and I found a copy in the local bookstore. And again, I'll tell you about my secret life. I, my doctor from Kaiser Permanente retired and I ran into him in the lobby of Kaiser. And he said, I wanna to get together with you. You're the only patient, this is quite a compliment, that I've ever had that I really wanted to talk to some more. We both were interested in the drama of baseball. And we decided to start meeting, we're still meeting. We're reading the complete works of John R. Tunis. We have supplemented it with the autobiography of Satchel Paige, which is just absolutely brilliant. It is life. It is the trauma, it is the ups and the downs. One thing that John R. Tunis does, which I think saves his fiction, according to Kurt Vonnegut, there's no romance in any of the books. There are no relationships, nothing. It's all about baseball. The problem is Vonnegut says, once you bring in romance, that's all anybody wants to know about and the rest of the drama is gone. So we talk about, the we've read the complete works of John R. Tunis, we've read all 10 baseball stories. I've read his two track and field novels. It's all about the problems that you face getting through the day, getting through life, the ups and the downs, et cetera. So because of this, and I think about what goes on in these baseball stories and how it applies to my life, uh, what the manager, how he lectured the team and how you're supposed to be impeccable on the field and watch out. And you may, the catcher may back up the first baseman 500 times when it wasn't necessary, but you do it that one time is gonna be very important. How to live your life. So I have found fiction to be powerful for me. And I think that's the way it affects a lot of people. Fiction is where it's at. Here's the advice I give people. I told you I would help your professional life. I wanna help your social life. Let's say you're invited to a party and you don't know anybody, but you gotta go. So here's what you do. I suggest what you do is watch the three current movies that are the most popular. Then you can walk up to anybody and you can say, have you seen Terminator 29? Wasn't it amazing? And you will get a conversation because people can talk about movies as literature because that's what they are, what they are. That's why they're so popular. And that's why they are so good for the most part. Literature dominates everything. We interpret our lives as a story. We have a beginning, a middle, hopefully eventually there'll be a long time from now, there'll be an end. And we are the hero, we are the protagonist of this adventure we're all going through. So fiction to me has been everything for philosophy, knowledge, everything. Check it out. Exactly, I think one of the things about fiction being sometimes more engaging is that you're, you're, when, when it's self-selected and you, you like the topic, you're in state of flow. 
as you usually say, that you're kind of so engaged in the story, it's so compelling that you go through the pages one after the other, and you're getting optimal input at the same time because you're reading all these words and structures, but you're not realizing that you're acquiring the language as you're reading them. So it's, it's an unconscious process of language acquisition and it's very compelling at the same time. So it meets all those criteria without even being aware. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Good points. We're not okay. opposed to nonfiction, believe me, but that's not all there is. Remember the Common Core when they told us that fiction is for wimps and you really have to read nonfiction and get tough and be prepared and, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. You get a lot of that through fiction, a lot. Um, what was the site that Nushin referenced for heritage language materials? Oh, um, it's called storiesfirst.org. So S-T-O-R-I-E-S. Um, F I R S T dot O R G. But it's one of many. So um, you can, and it can be any story. So it doesn't have to be um, particular ones. You can change the concept of the stories. You can, you can have them in different ways. Um, but it's one of many. Uh, I'm sure there are graded readers in different languages that can be used. Not so much in Farsi. We're working on that. <laughs> we're discussing what the kinds of comics book we were discuss. We're, we were discussing having comic books in in Farsi, but many other languages already have those. So those could be great uh, ways to find materials. You didn't mention my contribution to StoriesFirst.org. I have one story in it written in Mandarin, so check it out. All oh, right, is that like showing off or what? Okay. It is, but it's a good way, a good way. <laughs> it's a good way of showing off. I actually have your, one of your Mandarin books. <laughs> oh, that's, that was a full two books we wrote. Yes, absolutely. Right. I'll tell you the problem with uh, the books I wrote. I like the stories. I work with Linda Lee, very good Mandarin teacher, my teacher for a while. And um, it was a lot of fun doing them. The problem is they're too expensive. Mm -hmm. they cost like nine dollars each mm -hmm. i want these things to be cheap and as nushan just mentioned dr ashtari free which is what the website does that's going to be the future of all this pdf version <laughs> yeah pdf download put them together and we even have instructions claire walters put on instructions on how to fold things together and make a nice little novel that's the only way i'm going to be able to afford these things i'm running out of the ones i bought same with everybody. We have no choice. Exactly. Um, we've got another you. question. Can one of you address translingualism and what about bilingual readers with it? Okay, I, can, I cannot address translingualism because I have the slightest idea what it means. I've tried to read about it and I'm still confused. So I'll allow others who figured it out to talk about that. In terms of bilingual readers, let's go back and talk about bilingualism and bilingual education, which is oh, a wonderful thing. When it's done right, and that's the easy way, it's one of the best things, it is the best thing you can do for English. Uh, bilingual education, thanks to the work of uh, Jim Cummins, who explained it to everybody, who I think saved hours and hours of human suffering with his work, he's been truly heroic. I gotta tell you about my relationship with Jim, Jim Cummins, it's very funny. Whenever our paths cross, he says, Steve, I wanna to talk to you. <laughs> he sits down and he gives me a tutorial, which is magnificent. He introduces me to the latest research. Here's what's happening now. So I owe him a lot. I like saying nice things about him because he deserves it. Um, the, the point of bilingual education is simply this, a good education in a first language if you, you know, it isn't the case that the more English, the better. It has to be comprehensible. So when a child is entering school and knows no English and you give the child language arts and you give the child say math and some science in the first language, it makes everything more comprehensible. When he studies these things in English, he understands more. Um, uh, Grace McField, my former student did, I'm not, prejudiced on all this, did what I think is the absolute best meta-analysis of bilingual ed research. 
she found if the programs are set up right, and setting them up right means, of course, comprehensible English, good ESL, etc. It means good subject matter teaching, but it also means solid subject matter teaching in the first language. The results are better English than all day English programs. Remarkable. And that's been true ever since we've been doing the research here. Beginning stages, you have more first language, of course. They may do ESL in English, etc. cetera. Um, then gradually you start, you start to introduce subject matter in English and it's supported by the first language background. So this has been a great thing. Then part of all these programs we think should be heritage language development, which Dr. Ashtari has just given you a bit of a background on. Heritage language has no disadvantages. This is Jim Crawford's summary of the research. No disadvantages, only advantages. It leads to controversial topic, uh, being smarter, of course, you knew that, bilinguals are smarter. It means to all, it means practical advantages. Uh, the best way of saying this, I've heard, I think Joshua Fishman said this first, that if you want to buy, you can do it in English. But if you want to sell, it's good to know your customer's language. So it's good for the individual. It's good for economics, for employment. It's good for schooling. And you have all, suddenly you get all the wisdom of the family. You get to know what grandpa is telling you. You get all that knowledge, which right now, the um, Iranian kids in California are not getting. And we hope that with more Farsi, they'll get more from the rest of the family. They'll get this uh, wonderful gems of wisdom, wonderful stories and learn more about their heritage and this huge value in that philosophy, et cetera. Very interesting that you say that because I didn't include this data um, in, in the presentation and in the papers, but the bookstore owners that we were interviewing were saying that uh, after these two Farsi books that we mentioned, um, a lot of the Farsi acquirers buy the bilingual books. So the Farsi with the English translations. Yeah. But the issue with those was that the books that are translated that way, um, they're very difficult. So for example, there are poets such as Hafiz and Sadi and Rumi um, that are the, the original version are too difficult. The, yes. the original version is too difficult. To and a bilingual version won't help you. I am not, I'm sorry, I didn't get to that part of the question. I'm not a big fan of bilingual books. Mm -hmm. I think people buy them because they're charming. Mm -hmm. They're in, they look nice. And if you're an amateur linguist, it's fun to compare the, the two. If you like doing this, there's nothing wrong with that. The, what I prefer is, so let's say you're doing English, Spanish, English, Farsi. You get comprehensible Spanish, Farsi from the beginning in books that are only written in Spanish, only written in Farsi and you build up your knowledge until you can get to these things. The translation, you're just gonna go back and forth, look up words, and you're not gonna get much meaning out of it. So- Stephen? Yes. You mentioned a female writer after you mentioned Jim Cummings. One of our um, uh, watchers wants to know the name of that female writer. That was a long time ago. That was like five minutes ago. I have no idea <laughs> it, what I was talking about. Oh, sorry. It just popped up on the chat. Give me a hint and I'll, uh, why, what did I say? I, I talked about Isabel Allende, but that was a while ago. So I can't tell you. I don't remember. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, they just said it was a female writer. A writer of what? That's what I need to know. Yeah, I. Expert on bilingualism. So many. Really good. This is a growing good field. Uh, I did talk about, um, well, I, I'll, if you repeat the question uh, on the internet later, I'll, I'll give answers to, we'll give answers to lots of these things, okay? Okay, thanks. Um, we have another question. Do you believe Lexia levels are useful in the same way as graded reader sets? No. Next question. <laughs> We don't want people to get hung up on Lexile levels. The only thing that counts is whether the text is comprehensible. I don't approve of text being written to fit certain Lexile levels. I think if you want to write stories, and I hope you do, that you'll simply write stories 
that you think are comprehensible. People like people in this audience who have worked with children, who have taught them day in and day out, have a pretty good idea what is comprehensible simply by your feelings. It's like when uh, parents talk to kids, they don't think, well, I better not use relative pronouns for my uh, three-year-old, et cetera. I better make this in the present perfect tense instead of the con you know, future tense, et cetera. No, you don't. I shouldn't use too many examples of Saturn and Stoddard and all this confusing. You say things, your goal is to be comprehensible and you use what you intuitively know as someone who deals with people that age as to what is comprehensible. If you do that, just subconsciously making these decisions, the lexile levels will be perfect. They'll be just right. But if you go in there guided by lexiles, you're gonna wind up with stilted prose, in my opinion. Great. Um, the chat caught up with us. They said that the female writer that you mentioned, they think it was your student named Grace something. It was Grace McField, thank you. How could I, don't tell her that I forgot her name. <laughs> <laughs> Grace was a wonderful student and did this wonderful study. It's in a book that she co-edited. And let me tell you something that I did illegally. And I did it illegally deliberately. I Xeroxed her one chapter that she did with her husband, the meta-analysis, and I've put it on my website. So feel free to go there and download it. That's the major chapter of the book because she didn't write all the chapters. So I hope her work, that one chapter, gets some play. So look at my website, um, sdcrashen.com, sd -crashen look under bilingualism, and you will find Grace's and her husband's stunning uh, meta-analysis. So check it out, Grace McField. Thanks for the help on that. Um, okay, what are your thoughts on using blended learning or a flipped classroom in a content bilingual class? It depends on how it's done. If it's simultaneous translation, no, of course not. People are gonna wait for their language. If it's following the work of Dr. Benico Mason, if it's subject matter delivered in a comprehensible way with a little bit of help of the primary language when it's helpful, fine. So these are dangerous terms because they can be used in so many different ways. Okay. You don't need two teachers in the same classroom. You don't need, okay, let me make some enemies uh, for a change. Dual language, I find to be a very misleading term. I try not to use, in fact, I don't use it, even though I just did. When dual language means bilingual education, that means help with the first language when needed, et cetera, which is the way we do it, giving background knowledge, I'm fine. But dual language also means divided, having the kids who are exactly 50-50, half of them are dominant in one language, half of them are dominant in the other. That's tough. That's really hard work. I don't recommend that because you need two teachers. Um, whatever you say, or if there's one teacher, whatever you say, half the kids aren't gonna get it. So I find it extremely awkward. Bilingual education, sometimes that's called dual language. When uh, you're teaching basically in one language, using the second language for certain subjects. Uh, I posted a program on that, it's on my website. And it was the first chapter of a book I wrote on bilingual education years ago. And I'll tell you how we did it, how we worked the first two languages. In the beginning section, when the kids come in, basically, let's say Spanish, monolingual Spanish, all subject matter is in English, except Spanish, uh, English as a second language. And sometimes some PE is put in Spanish where they can use actions and all that. Then you gradually start introducing subjects in English in what are called sheltered classrooms, where the, it's made a little bit simpler. Uh, say math and science first, because they have the most background. This, and then gradually as they move along, the sheltered becomes mainstream, more complex, more abstract subjects like social studies are moved in sheltered, and there's a gradual transition. I like that way in the past, and now I'm wondering, 
how much that's necessary. If the kids do lots of free reading of fiction in English, maybe there's less of a need. Maybe they're gonna get a lot of subject matter that way. I really don't know. That is, I think, is an exciting area of research. But dual language itself, where it's you know, arbitrarily 50-50, you're doing half and half, I think that's a tough one. It's hard to do. Okay, what tips do you have for adult learners whose reading level is that of a child, but has the interests of an adult? Especially for a language such I as Japanese. I cannot allow you to insult the president this way. <laughs> Okay, I write Trump all the time. I, I tweet him back. I, I'm waiting for him to block me. That'd be really good for his career, for my career. Uh, what about adult beginners? Let me give you the two-word solution. Comic books. Comic books are so good. By the way, I haven't bragged enough about all the things I've done, so let me continue. I am the number one researcher in the world on comic books. The reason that's true is that I'm the only researcher in the world on comic books. And I earned the top prize in comic book research. About a third of you are gonna be so impressed and so jealous. I had lunch with Stan Lee and he paid, wow. I had lunch with Stan Lee because I went to a talk he gave at USC. He didn't know who I was. And it was time for Q&A. He was absolutely brilliant. He's just like the one who does the cameos, you know, the Stan Lee who does cameos in the movie. He's the same really friendly person. And that's him. He's a really nice guy. And um, I asked a question. I said, when is Peter Parker going to go back to college? Shouldn't he study science, uh, chemistry, and physics? Because he's this great genius. And he liked the idea and says, let's talk about it. So he invited me to lunch and I brought him all this information about uh, what Peter Parker would go through if he got a TA ship and all this stuff. He included it in the Sunday comics and the professor looked like me. Yes, my moment of glory. Uh, anyway, Stanley, we did talk about, com we talked about comics just about the entire time because he's the real thing. He likes it uh, just as much as we do. And I'm still answering the question. The interesting thing he brought up is the characters and their problems. This is why comics are interesting to everybody, including grownups, maybe especially. He brought in the idea of superheroes with problems, which is why Spider-Man is so interesting because Peter Parker has all these problems. He blames himself for his uncle's death uh, he has problems with the newspaper. He's, you know, always not getting enough money for what he does. And the editor of the newspaper has this hatred of Spider-Man, always wants articles about how bad Spider-Man is. His girlfriend, they're always breaking up. Superheroes with problems is what Stan Lee has given the world. So this should be, I find some of his comics breathtakingly interesting. No question. Stan Lee told me he volunteered this. He says, you know what my favorite character is? The Silver Surfer. The Silver Surfer faces the ultimate conflicts, the well-being of his family versus the survival of an entire planet. I'm going to wipe out this planet unless you sacrifice your uncle. You know, that kind of stuff. Whoa. Real ethical questions. The problem with comics, I think they're very good for everybody, but they're not that easy. Some are. Okay, you get comics for kids that are cute. Uh, the big ones though, the graphic novels, some of them have reading levels, 10th, 11th grade, and they're quite something. But they're gonna be more accessible, I think, than regular reading non-comic because of the pictures and the familiarity with stories. So I recommend trying that for older folks. I hope someday we will have graded comic books where people can read a Spider-Man comic that's been kind of toned down a little bit, that can be done, I think. So I think that's the exciting research of the future, comic books, graphic novels. Nushan, 
It sounds like you've learned some things about helping heritage Farsi speakers. So what insights can you offer to teachers working with people with different heritage languages, such as Spanish or Cherokee? Great question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, and I think I mentioned it a little bit. I think the basis of heritage languages is very similar in a way that um, a lot of migrants coming to live in other countries, their children grow up in environments that they try to blend in with the uh, with the target language, with with the uh, with the domestic language that is being spoken. And we we usually talk about club membership too. And I think that kind of blends in uh, with that 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 we don't speak the language of our parents, we speak the language of our friends and and those around us. So trying to make the language and a lot of uh, also a lot of Farsi language acquirers, as we saw, when they grow older, is when they try to come up and uh, go and uh, go back and try to acquire their their their, first, their her heritage language, and I think that kind of um, translates into heritage languages in general, such as Spanish um, and Cherokee and all these other languages. Arabic is another one. There are so many different ones that we see that the number of heritage language acquirers are decreasing, but we want to increase them. Um, so the stories, I think the parents can tell the stories. It, it's, it's raising awareness both in parents and children. So it, it goes both ways. That when you're telling the stories to the children, how about telling the stories with their heritage language so that they're, and they don't have to, you don't have to force output. Uh, you'd have forced them to have output. Uh, there's a story that Professor Krashen says, uh, tells sometimes about the German. Um, uh, the, the, there is a, I, I'll let you tell that story, but um, a lot of times by getting input, they can produce the language when necessary or later on. It doesn't have to come right away, but by telling them stories, by, by telling them about the culture, about your stories, your personal stories um, from the home country, the heritage language, the culture, that could be one way in any heritage language that they can acquire the language and they can they get the input that um, they need in order to acquire the language. So that doesn't exclude all the other heritage languages. It's, it's, it's very um, inclusive of all of them. So that will be my, my opinion, my insight, what research has shown in different heritage languages that provide the input, but it has to be so organic in a way. The traditional methods of go to class and heritage languages classes in general have been disliked, I think, in, in all heritage languages that um, we've, we've come across research from because they're, they're very, okay, this is the grammar, this is the words, this is the alphabet, that's it, go home and study. And a lot of them are during weekends or times that these children want to go out and play and they don't want to be stuck in a classroom. That makes them even not dislike um, acquiring their heritage language because it's it's not compelling, it's not interesting. It's, it's exactly the other what, of what we want the optimal input to be. So definitely you can, if they can go across the board with heritage languages, that it has to be compelling rich, abundant, and comprehensible. And it does it has it can be done in a very organic way. And there does not have to be any forced output that, okay, I'm gonna talk to you in Farsi or Spanish or Arabic or um, what the heritage language is and you need to respond back to me. Um, they can they will acquire the language subconsciously. Um, it's, not, it's going to happen. We just have to trust the process and provide as much input as possible. Should I tell the story? Yes, oh, please, yes, yes. Okay, um, Werner Leopold was one of the most well-known and brilliant scholars in the field of bilingualism. And he moved to California, to Santa Monica. And uh, his second daughter grew up in Santa Monica. He always spoke German to his daughters. He had two daughters. And the eldest daughter responded in German. She grew up in Germany. The youngest daughter though, grew up in Santa Monica in California. He spoke German to her. She always responded in English, always. And he describes it as a very healthy, warm father-daughter relationship. They would do stuff together, tell jokes, have a good time, everything you would want. But he never heard her speak German ever. And everything was fine. They finally took a trip 
to Germany. You know exactly what's going to happen. She was 17. They went to a party. She met a young man. He was amazed to hear this beautiful German coming out of her lips. Okay, that's the story. Speaking is the result of language acquisition, not the cause. Overwhelming evidence. We've got another question from chat. What are some good ways to hold students accountable for this reading that they're doing? Ah, ah. compelling reading. Then you won't have to read them, won't have to worry about it. Tell them fabulous stories. Oh gosh, we have learned so much from R.L. Stein, haven't we? R.L. Stein, the master of one, making you want to read more. It happens to us in these kitty books. You know, they're for six or seven years old, it's goosebumps. And he, you finish a chapter, you can't help but turn the page and I opened the door and guess who was there? You know, that kind of stuff. So I would get compelling literature and read alouds, especially R.L. Stein type authors where you don't read the whole thing and give it time for them to get interested. They'll want to read. If that doesn't happen, it's hopeless. They've got to want to read it themselves. And that's up to us to find books and stories that are maximally compelling and tell the story as if you love it, which is easy to go do if you get the right story. In live classes, how long do you have students read? Oh, I, I don't know. Um, I was a great fan for many years of sustained silent reading, and I still like it. Sustained silent reading, you put aside, say, 10 minutes a day, uh, and the kids read what they want to read, uh, etc. I wrote a paper on why it works and when it doesn't work, what went wrong. Okay, and it's usually, it's, near, it's always because they've ignored the theory. It's been quite successful, and I really don't know how to schedule it in a school day you're asking me to have the wisdom of an experienced teacher, which I don't have. I have the wisdom of an experienced quantitative researcher, okay? And uh, you guys know a thousand times more about this than I do. I would find a way of integrating it into the school day, still set aside some time for reading, let kids take books home. Uh, in Benico Mason's very early studies, her very first study, this is fascinating. The first time I met her was in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown University. She came up to me and said, you know, you probably aren't interested, you know, I'm sure that's the reaction people get. And here's a paper I wrote and I looked at it. It involved reading all period. That's the interesting part. It was English as a foreign language in Japan. And it was a class of students who hated reading and hated the class because it was traditionally taught of the kind that Dr. Ashtari has just mentioned, the heritage language, kind of grammar, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Mason in this study threw out the syllabus, this is like second or third semester English, and brought in graded readers that were comprehensible to students at that level. She allowed them to read and do nothing else the entire semester. What happened? They gained, they made very good gains. They gained more than students in traditional classes and they made excellent gains and they nearly caught up with the regular students. They were in a class for students who dropped out, who were, you know, didn't like the class, wanted to leave, et cetera, who were known as problem English students. She caught up with the rest of them at the end of the semester and they liked English class as much better. So what I've confirmed from this, <clears throat> so what Dr. Mason has discovered, a class that consists of all reading is much better than standard instruction. That's what she showed. Is it the best possible way of doing it? I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it is. I'll leave that up to more experienced people, people experienced in classrooms, uh, to design ways of finding out. Do you have any specific suggestions for newcomers with minimal literacy skills in their first language? Bilingual education, of course. First language, let's talk about reading. 
the theories of reading that I think are the best, believe it or not, I think Kenneth Goodman and Frank Smith were absolutely right. And that whole language is the way to go. I think there's no question when you look at the research and you look at it properly, in my opinion. Um, we learn to read, and here is the whole language philosophy in a nutshell, by understanding what's on the page. How about that? The more you understand what's on the page, the more you acquire. You don't learn to read by memorizing all the rules of phonics. Phonics helps a little bit for the simpler rules, but after that, it's not much of a help. They're too complicated to learn anyway. And if you do only phonics, you get very poor comprehension. They do better on phonics tests. They don't do better on reading comprehension tests. So I would start with first language, comprehensible text that give them the background they need for life in the United States. And then bring in English as a second language in a comprehensible way that features comprehensible texts that students can understand. And that's the focus, not hurrying up, getting ready for the exam at a certain point. That will come. I read an article, Australian newspaper, I wrote them, of course, called The Advocate. And they said, our problem is that 40, 50% of our students are below average. See what's wrong with that? <laughs> average means 50th percent. So if the students are at 45%, they're doing okay. And oh yes, in second grade, only 53% are reading at grade level. Grade level is average. It's the 50th percentile. We don't have a language problem. We have a math crisis. I wrote them, they didn't publish it. I've written about 10 letters like this. I think one got in because I think the people reading it didn't understand. Okay, what does he mean? Average, okay. So we can't be afraid of these tests. We can't uh, ruin children's lives by doing test prep. The irony is if you give them comprehensible text, background in the first language, they're gonna go over the top in all the tests eventually. It's what goes on in the long run. So not too worried at the beginning level. Uh, let's give them a good whole language program with comprehensible input and comprehensible reading and it will happen. And lots of reading in the first language, good combination. Um, what do you think the new areas of research in ELT are right now? If I knew I'd be doing it. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I don't know. We're making this up as we go along. And this is true in all the research. We're always stumbling along. If you want to know about scientific method and how scientists proceed and discover, I recommend a book <clears throat> by Hans Ohanian. Hans Ohanian, the name might be familiar because his wife, Susan Ohanian, is, I think, the voice of the American language arts teacher. She is so good. Uh, this is a biography of Einstein, and it's called Einstein's Errors. I, I, they put a blurb of mine on the back cover. This is my claim to fame. They say this isn't about Einstein's errors. This is about the scientific process, that it's sloppy. It's back and forth. We don't know what's coming next. We look at the next thing, go from there, go from there. One of my favorite parts is a section where Einstein wrote a paper got it published about a certain breakthrough he thought in physics. The next year he rewrote the paper, submitted it to the same journal, said last year's paper was wrong. Here are the corrections. The next year he wrote the same paper again. He did this four years in a row. This is what science is about. It's back and forth. It's non-linear and we depend on each other as we are, uh, Nushan and I do all the time. And we figure out slowly as I, get help from Jim Cummins, et cetera, and Benico Mason and uh, Jeff McQuillan and friends. And we gradually figure out what we should be doing next. And we are constantly revising what we're doing. The key is revision. You write it out, you see where you've gone wrong, you revise it and it makes you smarter. So that's the reason I can't give you an answer. I can't look ahead, I can't predict the future because we're making it up as we go along. And it's true in all areas of science. Um, my sons, one of my son's math professors who 
died at age 95 and was one of the world's, world's top algebraicists. And someone asked him, <clears throat> what's your work day like? And he says, well, about one third of the time I'm doing good work. Another one third of the time I'm making mistakes. The other one third I'm sitting around wondering how could I be so stupid? And this is true of everybody I know who does research. I can't tell you what we're gonna be doing next week. I can't tell you what I'm gonna be doing tomorrow. So how do you write grant proposals? I know that I've never written them, but I know the secret. Peter Latifogan is a phonetics professor and on my doctoral committee at UCLA. Here's what he did. And this basically tells us what the problem is. He asks for grant funds for projects he's already finished. Then he writes the grant and he uses it for going fishing for the next project. Brilliant. It's the only way to proceed. I can't predict what's going to be next. I wish, uh, and we find out, and tomorrow my views will be slightly different. I have this friend who has a little stamp that he puts on his paper. And the stamp is when he sends his paper out to friends, this does not represent my current position. It's exciting. That's the way it goes. And it is exactly what I've been learning from you in terms of research that we never know. We when we started Farsi heritage language acquisition That's right. research, we didn't have any. We it was just let's see what the issues are. And then every time we did a we did a study, we found out things that we could say, oh, okay, this is an interesting area to study. Let's let's study this, let's study that. So it, it's built up uh, on itself. It's not something that we we have a clear vision from the beginning. And I think Dr. Ashtari will agree with me that when we have professional talks, which is what we do, it's always, remember what I told you yesterday? That was so wrong. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> always, always, always found counter evidence, looking for counter evidence, and you rejoice. Mm -hmm. When you have to revise your paper and change it, it means you're learning something new and there's nothing like it. And that happened with one of the papers we just submitted. And then Absolutely. we found out that we need to revise right. it. We're going to get back to revise it. <laughs> Remember the wisdom of Noam Chomsky, who there's said, nothing there's nothing wrong with being wrong. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, it's happening to us as we speak. No question. Exactly. <laughs> True. I'll go with um, okay. I have a question about dual language programs again. Okay. Um, they asked, have you considered that dual language programs create a perfect environment for a language learners to naturally have a language parent since students interact with native speakers every day? Yeah, when you interact with a native speaker, it's got to be in a certain way. Just interacting isn't enough. Language parent is a term coined by a guy named Chris Lonsdale, who is an experienced language acquirer and a very sharp guy. He speaks uh, Mandarin, he speaks Cantonese, he's really good. And I think he lives in Hong Kong, okay, from New Zealand. We coined this term. Language parent is a speaker of the language you're trying to acquire who wants to be your friend or acquaintance and is not interested in learning your language. They just want to communicate. I'll tell you a few of mine. If you can replicate this in a program, that would be wonderful. I'll tell you my language parents, not because I'm different, but because I'm the same as you and you've had similar language parents. My German comes from a year I spent in Vienna as a, a middle-class well-to-do, coming from a middle-class well-to-do family. When I got interested, and I had parents who were so nice, oh my gosh, I did not deserve this. I keep feeling that my previous incarnation, I must have had a hard time. And my spirit guides gave me this incarnation to kind of make up for it. Everything has been so easy, my gosh, compared to other people who suffer. Anyway, they let me go to Vienna for a year to study piano, all expenses paid. Great. Let's go ahead, Steve. That's fine. And my language parent was my landlady, the wonderful Frau Novak. I went back to try to find her, I couldn't. Frau Novak and I, and I was a beginner, low intermediate in German, advanced, advanced beginner. 
and we would have tea two, three times a week and we would talk. And she would always repeat herself, which was great for a beginner, the same stories. And she was so friendly and kind. I loved having tea with her. She was my language parent. She was the transition between class and uh, interacting with native speakers. In Canada, my um, language parent was Hubert, who spoke perfect English, but he always wanted to speak French to everybody all the time. That was his politics, etc. And he was gentle and kind and wonderful, no question. I always had people like this. I always had them in every language that I've been successful in. In Hebrew, being on the kibbutz, I was loaded with language parents all the time who were kind, had no interest in English, etc. You're right in bringing this up with bilingual education. This is what we're looking for. We're looking for the kind of people who are going to be kind and nice to us, who are interested in us, who want real communication. That's the point. So thanks for bringing that up. I have a short paper on it on my website called Language Parents, in which I discuss Chris Lonsdale's ideas. So thanks for asking. Um, we had one that asked, um, what early SLA studies would you like to see replicated, if any? I don't know. I like that we're, let's talk about replication first. Uh, replication has been ignored. The um, thing on replication is that if you submit a replication to a journal, you'll have trouble getting it published. And there have been reactions to this because, you know, do something new. Come on, you're always doing the same thing. I was heavily influenced by one of my committee members, John Aller, who I took uh, testing classes from him, et cetera. And he got me interested in how science is supposed to work. Careful replication, extension of research results with small changes and you make, you know where we're going and you're constantly eliminating other arguments in a very arc or, or in a very organized way. It's built in replication all the time, constantly. And Benico Mason has replicated her results again and again. Replication needs to be done more frequently. Here's how it works statistically. Um, and I'm talking to the 2% of you who understand what was in your last statistics class, okay? Uh, let's say you do a study and it's significant at the 0.05 level. Great. Then you do another study. Similar, you replicate it and it's significant at the 0.05 level. What you can do then is you can multiply those 2.025s together. The total chances of it being at random are 0.025. Replication gives you a clearer, more convincing result. It's extremely important. And I always recommend that when you start out, start out replicating. You'll always be surprised. You'll always find something new, something different. It is the lifeblood of science. And when you fail to replicate, it means something must be going on. When you solve the mystery, you figure out why you'll have made progress. So thanks for bringing up replication. The, and I, I, God, I was the king of replication in those days in the late 70s, early 80s. I must have replicated uh, work on the natural order over and at least 20 times with so many, good for my Vita, okay. People said, you're just pumping up your Vita. We were doing real science and it was wonderful. Today, yes, I would like to see more studies replicating the silent period, of course that uh, things that the public is confused on and theoretical points, the whole idea of method comparison, one's comprehensible input with optimal input, one isn't. Those studies need to be looked at again. That's the basic work of science. Anything that gets you out of bed in the morning that where you're worried about a result, is it real? Go out and replicate. Do the exact same thing the other scientists did, make a small change in the direction you feel is important. Don't be afraid of doing it. It's what we need, it's what I need. I should say that again, just to be replicating. <laughs> um, switching back to reading, would you recommend using literature that could be used 
in the classroom that mostly talks about Native American culture and in this way our Native American students are able to connect with it? Yes and no. See, I, you knew I'd give a firm answer. Very clear. Yes and no. Uh, primary, great literature. Primary, no question. We would much rather have great literature than mediocre literature that happens to be about a group that we want to bring more attention to. No question. But nearly every group has great literature. So the primary thing is the great literature that reflects on values, et cetera. And there has to be so much of it available that it can be self-selected. That's what we're aiming for. Um, what is an effective way of providing comprehensible input to early childhood learners who do not yet possess the ability to process input effectively through reading? Stories. <laughs> Story time. Uh, I recommend a book, I don't want to assign it, uh, I mentioned it before, by Jim Trelease, The Read Aloud Handbook. It's riveting, oh my gosh. I'll tell you how good it is. I had a copy in my office and my mom came in and, be, and she said, can I borrow this? It looks interesting. So she took it home. And before I give you her reaction, let me tell you about me and my mom. <laughs> we had a perfect mother son relationship. Couldn't be better. It was wonderful. And she, my mom respected my professional accomplishments. She had read Power of Reading. She thought it was good. Uh, she thought it was a really good book. That's my boy, you know, that thing. She came back and she brought back uh, the Read Aloud Handbook. And she said to me, Stephen, why can't you write like this? <laughs> I said, I wish I could. That's how good the Read Aloud Handbook is. I give Jim Trelease the credit for popularizing Read alouds all through the English speaking world, all over the world, in fact. So that's the place to begin to find read alouds that have stood the test of time, um, et cetera. Your librarian will tell you they're the ones that do the read alouds, the stories every time, uh, et cetera. They know the good ones. And there are also case studies, um, the case of Paul. Uh, I think that it was one of those. So sometimes cartoons, even for early childhood, they could be in other languages that they can, they can, um, they're just watching something that is telling them the story. So it's, it's a version of stories that they're seeing and it's very interesting to them. So uh, oh, there are studies that- there God, are That was perfect. That was perfect. Thank you. That was just <laughs> right. Let's, let's talk about this. This is so good. Television, children's television. Wow, is it good. When I'm on an airplane, I, I don't think that's gonna happen for a while, but when I'm on an airplane and there's cartoons, if they have cartoons from regular show, I watch them. I even watch SpongeBob for my own interest. They're remarkable. Regular show is fantastic. And me and my grandkids watched it for years. We still, you gotta watch this one. Oh my God, you know. Uh, the people writing these things, are amazing. It's not just all violence and noises and all this stuff. It's very, very good. What uh, Dr. Ashtari is talking about is a case we looked at. His name is Paul. Uh, he grew up in the San Francisco area, uh, heavily uh, Cantonese speaking. Mom and dad from Hong Kong. Grandma and grandpa lived there, Cantonese speakers. And he grew up comfortably bilingual English Cantonese. Now, as you guys know, but most people don't, uh, Cantonese and Mandarin are not the same language. They're different. They're kind of like, you know, Spanish and Italian. They're not the same. If you know one, it gives you a head start, but you don't immediately start speaking the other. You don't understand everything, um, et cetera. So a babysitter, his parents, one of whom was my uh, former student, Christy Lau, who's now my colleague, um, his parents were working real hard in those days. Dad had a job in the Silicon Valley. I know he's still working hard. Christy was a beginning teacher then, and a beginning professor. And they hired a babysitter every so often to watch their boys. The babysitter was a Mandarin speaker. And she would come in and turn on the TV to Mandarin cartoons, which Paul would start watching. 
Now, thanks to the overlap in vocabulary, that helped a little, and thanks to the friendly caretakers, the, uh, he started understanding the cartoons, watching the same ones again and again, they'd repeat, and he got interested. Eventually, he started watching children's television in Mandarin. And when he got to high school, dad would bring home two movies every week in Mandarin, and the whole family, grandpa, grandma, everybody, would watch the news every night in Mandarin. Today, Paul speaks Mandarin. He speaks quite well. When families come over and they're Mandarin speakers, he's fine. And the family has gone off on vacation to Beijing, to Taipei, Mandarin speaking areas with his mom and dad. He's had no trouble. He's done perfectly well with it. So he's picked it up. Here's the crucial point of all this. And this is why I'm so happy Dr. Ashtari brought this up. Paul doesn't care about Mandarin. He doesn't care one way or the other. Now in China, the Chinese cultural division, Hanban, is very interested in making everybody a Mandarin speaker. This is the link that binds us together and all this kind of talk and urged everyone to learn Mandarin. Paul didn't care. Paul liked the cartoons. It's the compelling input that counts. This is what they don't understand in heritage language classes. You can't tell a kid, you know, you really should pay attention in Spanish class because you're Hispanic and you know, this will be good for you. You'll make more money, et cetera. Or even Spanish is a foreign language. This is going to be, this isn't going to get anywhere. They, they're thinking about going skateboarding. You know that, okay? But tell a compelling story. And they will, exactly. And they will acquire whether they want to or not. Compelling input is the key to successful classes and you as a teacher will be a lot more happy in your class. So thanks for bringing that up. Stories are good, reading is good, telling stories. Don't neglect television. Some TV programs are wonderful. These are geniuses who write that, who write these things. It's literature. Okay, um, we've got a question for Nushan. Um, it's actually a comment. Uh, they were so excited to stumble on this today. They work with English language learners in an international school setting. However, they are particularly interested in techniques to help their own first grade son become literate in Farsi during break and boost their own Farsi literacy along the way. Do you have any do you have any tips for them? Um, I do. <laughs> okay, great. First of all, I, I came across that question uh, when I saw it. I was like, this is great. So thank you for being here. I think her name was um, Sarah. So we, yes, Sarah Sadhandu. So thank you for that question. Um, I think, actually, first of all, thank you for caring so, to share your heritage language um, with, with your son. Um, one of the mistakes that I personally made when I first moved to, well, I'm originally from Iran, as you can tell, uh, that, uh, and I moved here for my, um, for my graduate work. And when I moved here, I started tutoring and teaching Farsi. And it was one of the errors that I myself made in the beginning that I started with the alphabet and I started, uh, I started going, <laughs> I did the traditional method myself <laughs> and I realized that it doesn't work. So um, that those stories, though the the concepts that we've been talking about for the past two hours, I think those are those are what we need before we get to the um, alphabet and all those. Okay, write this word, write that word, or write them this letter, because those are areas that if we don't start on a good foot, it's not it's it's going to it's going to deviate a lot in the language acquisition journey of your son, um, Sarah. So I think I think trying to tell stories or cartoons, there, there are some Farsi cartoons or even trans, we call them duple <laughs> in Farsi. So there are translations of the same same cartoons that um, they, the Disney cartoons and um, others that they're in Farsi. So trying to play those, um, trying to tell stories in Farsi before you get into um, 
those, you know, okay, now get the first grade book, let's go through it together. You can get there, definitely, but you need to provide a foundation before you get there. You need to um, gauge their interest in the heritage language first before they get there. And again, don't, don't try to, don't make, don't force them to respond back in Farsi or produce the language before they're ready, because they're going to do that after a while, but once they're forced and they think that, um, and one of the other questions that came up was the effective filter, when they feel like they have to respond in Farsi or they have to, or they get blamed if they don't, then that's going to affect their, the way that they, uh, first of all, view Farsi as their heritage language or any other heritage languages. They're going to be like, oh, why do I need to speak Farsi? It's just no use. Um, so th that way they're just getting the input. They're telling the stories. You're, you're doing all these other things. They're watching the cartoons, their TV shows. Um, and also they're learning about, we do have stories in Farsi that are very interesting in Iran that are very interesting. but. Our responsibility as parents and also heritage language people <laughs> in general is to find the ones that are interesting for our students and our family members who are trying to acquire the language. And that can have a little bit of trial and error of finding the ones that are interesting and then uh, the students themselves, the language acquirers themselves selecting them. But it's going to get there, but just trying to include all these possible optimal input opportunities for them so that they can they can have that they can find that missing piece that we talked about and they can roll on their own that would be my answer rated cartoons great <laughs> minds think alike yes i know <laughs> <laughs> exactly and there's so many of them they have translated most of them and they're playing them on tv and youtube i think has been phenomenal in this uh, in this aspect because there are so many short clips that are in all are of these comprehensible for beginners though exactly they well, are yeah some of them are not all of them but the good thing about children is that they with youtube even my two-year-old nephew <laughs> Ilya, you know him he He's two years old. Even when he was one, he would pick the ones that he, they're short clips. So he would pick the ones that he liked. If he didn't like it, he would change it. Wow. And the, that idea of switching the channel, having the control and switching the channel, wow. channel works a lot, I think, in, in language acquisition, whether heritage or not. So I think that that's, those are great tools that we can definitely use for heritage language learners or English language learners in general. I didn't know they were available. That's phenomenal. Yes. Good. Okay, we have lasted our two hours, but I have one last question, if we can get it in. How can we meet the gaps of reading in young learners since their attention span is quite short? They are allergic to boredom. The uh, Frank Smith says the, we can be in any one of three, three uh, states of mind. We can be confused, we can be bored, and we can be learning. Confusion and boredom make up most of the school day. It's a combination of confusion and boredom. When we make it exciting, attention span goes on and on as every parent knows. It's finding the right activities. And we've all been victims of this and we have all perpetrated it. Me too, Dr. Ashtari. I was a terrible teacher for a while. We all, you know, use those methods, etc. Thank you. You make me feel better. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> I did that in Ethiopia. I was teaching eighth grade English. I was driving them crazy. I thought I was so good. What's wrong with them? <laughs> What's wrong with them? Not yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'd like to thank you both so much for this informative uh, talk, both of them. And I'd like to thank all of our audience members. If you have more questions, please uh, take them to our blog at otsol.org or our Facebook page, um, which is otsol on Facebook. Um, and we will see about getting those answered for you. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you for having us and organizing this event. Yes. It was so much fun. <laughs>